Hello and welcome to this celebration of Zafar Iqbal's 30-year career to date in public health. My name is Christopher Gidlow uh, and I'm going to be your chair for this event. I am a, a professor in applied health research here within the Centre for Health and Development at Staffordshire University and we are hosting this live stream event. Um, just by way of background, our centre is uh, the Centre for Health, of, and health and Development or CHAD. Um, we are a collaborative research centre. Um, originally established in partnership with Stoke-on-Trent City Council and Staffordshire County Council and indeed um, our, our speaker today, Zafa, alongside Aliko Ahmed were the key founding members of, of our group. Um, our research around health improvements and health inequalities is quite broad, we cover a range of areas and you can find all the information you like on our website. Uh, to today's speaker, um, for many of you I'm sure Zafa will need no introduction. He is a visiting professor here at the university. He holds honorary professorships at two other international institutions. He has sat on the National Expert Committee for um, NHS Health Check. He is the current chair of the UK Faculty of Public Health's Pakistan Group and a member of the Global Health Committee. For his day job, Zafir is the Associate Medical Director for a large NHS Community Trust and holds honorary titles at the Health Services Academy Islamabad and Khyber Medical University. I'm also very pleased to say that today we are joined by David Kidney who is going to facilitate this discussion. Um, until recently David was the Chief Executive of the UK Public Health Register and is the uh, current Executive Chair of the West Midlands Health Technologies Cluster. David has also been the Member of Parliament for Stafford and uh, a, a minister within the Department for Energy and Climate Change. The format for this session, um, we have agreed some questions in advance. Um, th these are designed to allow Zafa to talk, talk us through his career to date and draw on some of those key lessons and learning points that he's now keen to share with those who are starting their public health careers. We have allowed some time at the end for questions, so please do submit any questions you have into the chat function on, on the YouTube page as we go through and we can draw out some of those and ask as many as we have time for at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to David to ask the first question. Thanks very much, Chris, and uh, a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm in conversation with Professor Zafar Iqbal. And Zafar, this is a very important week, not just because of this talk, but also in public health terms in England, we've seen the demise of Public Health England and two new agencies in its place, the UK Health Security Agency and the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities. What do you make of the changes? Uh, I'm really pleased you've raised that, uh, David. It's a really big week for public health. And I think it's important that we recognise the contributions that Public Health England have made. Um, the general public, I feel, um, you know, really do appreciate the sacrifices frontline NHS staff have made over the last two years in the pandemic, but perhaps not, um, and, uh, not known as much are the immense dedication and the hard work that uh, frontline public health staff, both in local authorities and in Public Health England have made. And I think we should be very grateful for, the, for that. And uh, it, you know, I think they've helped to save the nation uh, with their high, with their skill. We're very lucky in this country to have a very highly skilled specialist workforce working in uh, on the kind of um, um, front line. And uh, I think we should applaud all the work they've done. But more than that, I think also, David, it's important to recognise some of the work they've done before that. And you know, for example, the word, or the work of the knowledge and intelligence function uh, within PHE uh, has been uh, absolutely remarkable and the, uh, and the rich array of data they've made available to frontline staff is, 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 is really incredible. So um, a big thank you certainly from me and I'm sure the audience will agree that uh, you know, they will all be uh, very grateful for the work PHE have done. Uh, yes, I'd certainly echo that myself with my thanks to Public Health England and everybody who worked for it. And I hope that they all find homes in these new agencies where they can continue their very good work. But let's look at today. We seem to have generated quite a lot of interest in your talk, Zafa. <laughs> Why did you decide to do it? Um, I thought it was a good idea at the time, David. I'm not so sure now. <laughs> um, when I, once upon a time when I was a young consultant, I, I heard a 
uh, a similar talk from a very distinguished uh, um, uh, uh, public health consultant. And I came away very inspired. I came away with lots of ideas. And a few months ago, I thought it'd be a good idea to maybe share some of the ex you know, successes, failures that I've had and maybe, uh, maybe have a discussion about. Um, um, I don't think we do enough reflection within public health. And um, I think it's a great opportunity for maybe I could ask the audience here. Well, I think we've got a, a reasonable audience. Maybe perhaps everyone else could also share their words of wisdom, their, uh, uh, their kind of tips for other people, their thoughts and their reflections. Um, so, <laughs> that's, so that's, that's, that's where we are. OK, I would uh, echo that uh, invitation to the audience, as uh, Chris did too. Where people who are very welcome to send in questions comments, your own observations about the conversation today. And also the your tips on for, for, for other people. Indeed. Uh, and I might even try and write some of that up uh, at the end. Well, there's an <laughs> offer to people. So um, let's go to the beginning of your career, um, Zafa. You completed your medical training first in London, and then you went back to your home county of Yorkshire for your GP training. And then after those two things, you decided to go to North Wales for public health training. I don't quite understand why you did that. Uh, for me, it wasn't one single moment in time, oh, I want to do public health. Um, I, I can remember, um, well, mid-70s now, uh, sitting in front of the dean of a Med London medical school at the interview, uh, and him asking me, you know, we've got uh, lots of people with your grades, why should we pick you? And in those days, it was, I mean, it still is pretty tough to get into um, um, medicine, but, you know, very few people went to university. It was maybe 5 6%, unlike 40% it is now. And uh, so I, I made the argument in terms of uh, the northern uh, mill town I came from, and I described some of the socioeconomic factors and how they influenced health, and I think that must have convinced him to uh, give, me, give, oh, yes. give, give me a place. And like I said, I went back up to Yorkshire to do um, uh, general practice. I had two very contrasting experiences, one in a very, very poor place, and I could see the impact of socioeconomic factors on health, and one was a very middle class town where I could see good, uh, where I could see good, good, um, sort of good health there. And then uh, I went to Wales where I was met with, a, it was almost like a war zone at the time where, 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 where it was, uh, um, they were dealing with one of the largest outbreaks of salmonella I think ever seen. Uh, uh, and uh, there was, I think at the end of it, there were 600 cases. So there were dozens of volunteers there trying to do uh, contact tracing and uh, uh, apply food questionnaires. Um, so it was a it was a pretty kind of um, baptism of fire, so to speak, to when I joined the training scheme there. So I was wondering, I wonder what your family must have thought of thinking you were settled back in Yorkshire and then you go to North Wales for your training instead. And um, I don't know if we can ask, can we, what um, your family thought? I, I think I was... When I first got married, he had um, just finished his GP training in Hebden Bridge. And the plan was that as soon as we returned from our honeymoon, we'd be moving to North Wales where he was going to embark on his training in public health. And it became a bit of a standing joke that actually I had no idea what public health was about at the time, let alone what a career in the field was going to entail. And I certainly hadn't realised when I agreed to marry him that for the next five years he would in essence be a student again and that we'd also spend the first five years of married life moving around the country from Wales to Leicester until finally settling in Stafford in 1994 when he was appointed a consultant. I can honestly say that I have never met anyone who is so committed, so passionate about their work. Public health hasn't been Zephyr's job for the last 30 years. It's been a vocation, a calling, a passion that he has dedicated over half his life to. And I'm sure Zephyr's going to mention some of the key individuals who during that time helped and guided him. And he has been very fortunate in that he's had these individuals, not just as mentors, but as friends who have supported him in what at times hasn't always been easy either. 
but um, Zaffa lives and breathes public health and he gives his all in whatever he does whether that's the work that he's been involved in with the Faculty of Public Health, with UK PHR, um, the Pakistan um, Public Health Group that's part of the faculty, um, or establishing the Centre for Health and Development right here at Staffordshire University. Zafa is so committed to public health, um, I regularly hear him advising young people to actually consider, a, consider it as a career choice and some have actually taken his advice, sadly, not his own children yet. Um, but throughout his career, one thing that has remained steadfast has been his humility. Um, in particular, he always remembers and talks about his background and recognises how incredibly lucky he has been that fate brought him to the UK as a four-year-old from a very, very poor background in Pakistan to a country that recognised and nurtured him to fulfil his potential. I'm incredibly proud of all that he's achieved. And actually, I'm even more proud of all the things that he hopes to achieve in years to come. So, um, thank you very much to Hifsa. Uh, Zafa's wife, and for you who are watching us today, um, Hifsa is in the studio with us, and uh, you might have gathered that uh, Zafa didn't know about this, and uh, I take full responsibility for the surprise <laughs> element involved, but there was a very, very heart meant uh, tribute to you, really, from somebody who knows you very well about your commitment to public health, and that's how it is today. I want to take you back, if I may, to Wales, and your commitment to public health <coughs> really shone through because you took like a duck to water to population-based approaches and you gave me a, a couple of examples which I think we should share with our audience about the Wales-wide needs assessment for patients undergoing MRI scans that you developed. Um, and you were curious why um, patients with mental health who had deafness spent longer in hospital than those who didn't have deafness. And you went and looked into that. Tell us about those two things. Um, well, back in the 1990s, uh, MRI was a relatively new technology, and the question people were asking was, how many scanners uh, uh, do, you know, do, we, uh, do we need? Uh, where is it cost-effective, etc.? So I did a needs assessment, which can inform some of that policy making. The question about mental health and deafness is an interesting one, in that uh, when we looked at the data, uh, we found that at that time people with deafness and mental illness weren't just you know, staying in hospital a few days longer, not even a few weeks, often months and years longer. Yeah. And that was around um, misdiagnosis, uh, that was around uh, late diagnosis or, um, or suboptimal treatment. And uh, so we did some work around that and uh, th I'm pleased to say that in one of the things that, that led to was a specialist service for deaf people with mental illness in Wales and we also I think managed to publish that as well. Brilliant, yes, very good. I know that today you want to raise with us one achievement which above all others you're, <coughs> you're proud about. Um, but I know from my personal experience when I was a Member of Parliament of at least three other experiences where you had something that you contributed that other people didn't. Um, and I'm just thinking of asking you to say a few words about each of these. I mean, the first one was that uh, as a new MP, I visited my local prison and was astounded how bad the health care was. And I know that you took charge reasonably soon after that for four hospitals with their health care in my region. And the second one was that there was a, an outbreak of Legionella in Stoke, which attracted my attention instantly because there'd been an outbreak that had caused fatalities in Stafford Hospital some years before. And the other one was um, a, a lovely little story, really. There's a, a building now in Stafford called the Signpost Centre, which became quite a community hub in my time as an MP, but you were responsible for it. Tell us about those three experiences. Um, well, perhaps we can start with the prisons. Uh, yes, it was. I mean, often people don't realise that um, uh, prison health wasn't provided, was part, wasn't part of the NHS. So the government policy at the time was to transfer, and uh, that was partly my kind of responsibility. Um, and I was equally shocked, David, in terms of the level of mental illness among this particular population. I think it was something like 80%. 
uh, in, you know, really um, uh, severe addiction problems, um, uh, dental uh, issues, uh, lack, uh, lack of access to primary care. And I think that whole shift to the NHS mm. hopefully led to uh, some improvement in some of their health outcomes. Uh, the Stoke story, uh, the Stoke Legionella story is a really interesting one in the sense that um, um, if I can show you some data around this. Oh, that, that, that was uh, um, that was the pre. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the. Uh, uh, there was a salmonella outbreak in, in Wales, which was one of the biggest outbreaks in Europe at the time. But well, I'll, um, uh, I'll go on to the. So, in terms of uh, Legionella, uh, like most health protection incidents, it was towards the end of the week where we realised there was something uh, serious happening, and uh, we were in the middle of a deadly. Legionnaires outbreak, which was really brilliantly led by Public Health England, uh, and often, you know, with this kind of outbreak, we may never find the cause. Uh, but in this particular um, uh, outbreak, um, I mean, Public Health England, with their with great skill and sort of uh, great expertise, they we managed to find the cause within a week, and we were to able to able to curtail curtail the epidemic. And the one particular point I want to make was that um, uh, there were many, many um, uh, possible causes, and uh, and the over the weekend, the environmental health officers worked extremely hard uh, to identify, to take, undertake the sampling and identify the cause. And one very astute environmental health officer took uh, some sampling from a hot tub which turned out to be the cause for, for, for this. So really, I, I'd really like to pay tribute to um, uh, Public Health England for leading this investigation and also uh, the environmental health officers who, who actually were part of the team. Yeah, I think you were the director of public health in Stoke at the time, so you ought to pat yourself on the back for leading the home team. I accept that Public Health England yeah. contributed such a lot. And I definitely want to agree with you about the importance of an environmental health workforce for public health purposes. Yeah, that's great. And the and the story around the signpost centre was that um, at that particular time, uh, whenever we did a need assessment, there was a red blip within Stafford where there were poor health outcomes. Uh, we were very short of money at that time, and the public sector generally was uh, was actually uh, strapped for cash. So I didn't have any money to play with, uh, and so what I did do was uh, I pulled everyone together who had a stake there, and as soon as I advertised that, you know, loads of people turned up, uh, including volunteer organisations, the local Tesco's, the church. It was a packed, packed hall. And uh, the council volunteered to donate a building. They said, I I you know, we can't run it, but we'll refurbish it for you. It was a derelict building. Uh, but lots of other agencies offered their services. Uh, but then we were left with the problem of how to run it, because we need money to run it. And the local church offered to, um, to, actually, run, uh, to actually run the centre themselves through a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And I think they're still running there today. Uh, yep. to the, this was almost 15 years ago. Yep. Yes, I knew the church that ran it. Uh, <laughs> I held advice surgeries there. The police held surgeries there. It was a very, very valuable community asset. So thank you for that. But if we move on, I know that what you want to talk about is your contribution in primary care, where I think you did do groundbreaking things. Um, the, the kind of uh, link between um, um, uh, public health and primary care is kind of well established uh, and because, you know, really good uh, primary care will be a really powerful force for public health, both Absolutely. in terms of lifestyle issues, uh, but as well as treating serious illness like, uh, you know, cancer and long term conditions. But there can be also be really valuable assets in the local community and they can have links with uh, local voluntary organisations. Uh, they can have citizen advice bureaus within their surgeries. Uh, so that link is, is, is kind of really strong. And this, this particular story is um, when I was uh, in Stoke and uh, there's a conversation with the chief executive who was at that time um, under pressure to do something about uh, the poor life expectancy in Stoke. And uh, the conversation went along the lines of, well, if we were serious about uh, some of this, then we need to tackle the social determinants. But clearly those aren't in his gift and he was a man in a hurry. Uh, but one thing you could do, which could uh, kind of deliver more immediate results were 
improve the quality of primary care and, the in, and generally the inverse care law applies uh, with kind of primary care with uh, often the places who uh, have the best quality of primary care often often have the best health. Uh, so we set about, uh, I worked with uh, um, uh, sort of a, a very prominent uh, GP, academic GP, and we defined what good good looked like in terms of primary care, and we de uh, developed that enhanced outcomes framework. Uh, we looked at structure, structural issues within primary care. Uh, we also focused on health in um, uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, this was before the National Health Service checks came in, and we uh, called people in with high high risk of CVD. Uh, we not only offered them medical reviews, we offered them a lifestyle coach, positive thinking, free access to gym uh, or walking groups, etc. And on top of that, with uh, with uh, Professor Gidlow's team, we undertook a cluster RCT at the time. Um, so it's, it's it's really that scale. You know, we worked across the whole population, really, rather than just kind of uh, one or two practices. Uh, just to say, you know, we did, um, you know, we, um, uh, you know, we we published a, a number of papers around this, and a lot of my inspiration for this work come came from um, uh, Julian Tudor Hart, where uh, he was a GP in the 60s and 70s, and uh, working in the Welsh Valleys, where uh, uh, health was very very poor, and he did a lot of groundbreaking work around opportunistic screening for uh, cardiovascular disease, long-term conditions. He, you know, he provided anticipatory care. He, he measured data, he measured death rates, he measured illness. Uh, he did a lot of research around that. And, uh, you know, remember this was 30, 40 years before the National Service Frameworks for Heart mm -hmm. Disease, Diabetes came in. And he was doing this, you know, in the 60s. And even, to, you know, to this day, I know the faculty of public health are working together with the uh, national leads for health inequalities and CVD to, for example, improve hypertension management and detection of hypertension. And so I think we've still got a lot of lessons to learn from to, to the heart. Hmm. And I'm sure he'd be proud of you for putting it into practice and things like health tests and uh, personal trainers. You were very much ahead of your time with those. So well done. Thank you. So I, I know it's been 30 years now that you've been in public health and you've been giving thought to what you'd like to say to the people who follow in your footsteps. So over to you with the advice that you would give to those starting out as public health consultants today, the kind of people who are on the register of the UK Public Health Register, which I ran and where you were the registrar. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, mentioning that, David. Um, I mean, these are the, some of the things that worked for me. I'm not sure they work for every, uh, sort of every, uh, everyone else. So I hope people are now putting in lots of their own ideas on uh, on, the, on the chat. Um, I think the first one is to, it's a bit like the, that's why I gave the story about the primary care. It was across the whole area. And I think, we, you know, we do need to think big. You know, if you work backwards from a public health outcome, uh, and then to see what scale of intervention you need, you need, you need. That, that gives you an idea of uh, what you need to do. And often the small scale stuff might be good for hearts and minds. It may not make a difference to health outcomes. So I think 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 big, maybe start off small, but certainly think big, you know. Um, that'd be my first point. I think second point is, I think work with people who are uh, passionate, it's that heart, uh, heart, hearts and minds things. And uh, so I was very lucky to work with, uh, you know, Professor Ruth Chambers around the primary care work. At the moment, I'm doing a lot of work around older people. And I'm very lucky to work with Dr. Amit Arora and Dr. Susie Roberts, who are equally passionate about this area. And uh, I think, but your team needs to be diverse. So I think you need a wide range of skills. You don't want to get into this problem of kind of groupthink. Um, so, you know, uh, so hearts and minds is really important. Uh, one thing that someone taught me uh, many years ago was uh, when you come across really complicated uh, situations, three questions they told me to ask, which have served me well. One was around, uh, you know, what is the population you're looking at? What's your intervention? What are the outcomes you're looking at? Uh, that's always helped me. 
Um, uh, for those of you who remember, uh, Rod Griffiths was the faculty president uh, and he was a legend in the West Midlands and he always talked about um, not be afraid to upset people, make, make waves, but obviously, you know, be careful about picking your battles and setting your red lines. But we're, 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 we're here not to just follow opinion, we're here to make opinion and, uh, and often public health is about selling ideas. So I've got a few more uh, that have worked for me. Um, uh, the next one is, uh, I, I, you know, I, you, you know, I've made far more mistakes than I've had successes, to be honest, David. Uh, but it's important to learn from your mistakes and and have some kind of reflection time. And what would you have done differently? Uh, it's really important. Uh, this is, I think, this is a useful one. Uh, often, when you get a new job, uh, you have a honeymoon period, and I think it's a great opportunity to make change and often you'll make you'll have a greater opportunity to make change in that first six months or first year or so than you will do later on in uh, in in your job and that's because uh, I think when you're starting off people will give you latitude uh, but when you're part of the system it's much more difficult the system tends to bite back if you if you uh, change the system um, I think get a coach uh, that's always valuable advice um, I've always found visiting frontline staff or seeing uh, mem meeting members of the public or um, uh, visiting services always really, really helpful. And whenever I do do that, I always come back inspired and come back with new ideas on how to tackle a problem. So always take, put time in your diary to visit the front line. OK, well, um, you heard Zaffer, everybody. He wants to hear what you think of his tips. Are they the right ones? Do you strongly support a particular one of them? Do you think something's missing? I think if I were to add something, it would be around skills to do with political literacy and media savvy, really, yeah. to, for, for today's age. Anyway, Zafa, you're not just active in the UK, but you've got strong connections with public health in Pakistan, haven't you? That's, that's right. Uh, actually, I've got a few more slides, David. So, uh, okay. this, this, so, so the, this, this was about the three, oh, your three qu questions. Three questions, yes. Uh, this one was about um, you, know, you know having uh, having a diverse team, uh, and I think that's really important because I have been in situations where you know we've had uh, you know group think, group and I think thing, that can yes. be really dangerous. Very. Um, and the, and this is about you know uh, not following just following popular opinion and actually standing out when you had to. Um, and in terms of a coach, I, I was very fortunate to have uh, Sam Ramaya uh, uh, as a coach. And I think many, many other people were in the West Midlands. He, he was an absolute monumental figure. Uh, this was an obituary in The Guardian where I took this from. And he, you know, he's he really important in terms of building your confidence, in terms of um, um, energ uh, energizing you and uh, I know you gave a support to a lot of people really so uh, I think I certainly owe a lot of big you know debt of gratitude to Sam uh, for some of the work that I've done yeah so back back to your question about uh, Pakistan so uh, 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 early this year uh, we had a workshop where um, we had the Minister of Health uh, attending, we had the, uh, the British High Commissioner, the Pakistani High Commissioner and senior leaders in public health like um, in Pakistan like uh, Dr Shahzad Ali Khan, like uh, Dr Zeal Haq from uh, Hyber Medical School and we, uh, we had a look at what um, future systems for public health Pakistan might need post pandemic. Many countries, for example, the UK, we started off with uh, the new kind of uh, restructure of public health. Many countries are looking at what future systems they need. So we, um, following this workshop, we produced a discussion paper on some of the things that Pakistan might consider. And uh, again, I'd really like to thank uh, a lot of my colleagues in the SIG, like Dr. Samir Latif, like Dr. Um, uh, Naveed Saeed and uh, Dr. Mamuna Tahir, who's helped, and many others who helped with this work. Brilliant. And uh, that's quite a team, that picture that you've <laughs> shown us of uh, the Pakistan team. So, I mean, another international aspect of our present situation is COVID-19. It's affected the entire world. But in terms of your own career and your work in this country, what has kept you busy on the COVID-19 front during these last two years? Uh, we started quite early, early on um, 
uh, looking, there was at that time there was a lot of focus on acute care, and there wasn't the the spotlight on community services was uh, was not there. So we started looking at rehabilitation needs after COVID because we were getting flooded with people with quite severe complications, and at that time the term long COVID hadn't been coined yet. Uh, so we did some, uh, we worked together with uh, my colleagues in Lancashire, I know uh, Jane uh, uh, Beanstalk's on the line, and uh, we did some modelling around uh, long COVID, which, um, which helped us to develop our local services uh, sort of around COVID, and this is about to be published in the Journal of Public Health uh, um, 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 uh, in the next edition. Uh, the, other, the, the other thing, actually, before I, I go on to that, the other thing we worked on was mental health uh, issues. Clearly, with the pandemic and the lockdown, it, it, it was a strain on, on the nation, strain on young people, uh, and there was a big increase in terms of mental health issues, uh, both in terms of the general public as well as those people with existing mental illness, uh, as well as those people suffering from COVID. Mental health is, a, uh, again, a serious complication. So we did some modelling work. Again, I worked with my colleagues in Lancashire sort of around that. Uh, the other piece of work we've been doing is, uh, I think one of the things I'd just like to give a plug to is in terms of the future. Um, I think I think our health and social care systems are failing older people, and uh, I'd, I'd just like to put this quote up from Atul Gwandi. If you haven't read his book *Being Mortal*, is well worth reading. And I'll just I'll just give people a moment to read through that. And I think it's quite sobering to um, read this quote and one of the pieces of work that we've been doing on behalf, on behalf of our local uh, integrated care system is, uh, is uh, we've been developing an older people's healthy raging strategy which tries to address some of these issues. Mm, including, it's, it seems, boredom, loneliness and helplessness. Absolutely. OK, well, we've talked about COVID-19 and for sure the world will face other serious health challenges in the future may be another pandemic but it may be something completely different and I know you have your eye on the risks from climate change don't you? Uh, if I can just yes I mean uh, I don't think I need to make the argument for climate change to this audience um, and uh, I was just thinking you know what are what the public health role could be within the, within that debate and I know uh, ASFA have done some fantastic work uh, around competencies for uh, public health around climate change. And uh, it's worth reading their documents around that. Uh, some really important questions about the you know, role of individuals, which we tend to focus on. But, but the biggest uh, the impact is always policy. You know, it's in, in not just national policy, but international policy. But in order to uh, make sure you know, we make the right policies, I think it's really important that we keep this uh, uh, debate in, in the minds of the public. And I think it's our job to make the case for uh, you know, anti-climate change measures uh, and to take, our, take the public with us. Uh, so it's a bit like you know, to the work we did with tobacco. I think we need to change public opinion. We need to, because the politicians will listen to the public. So I think it's really important we, we keep the focus on that because at the, at the end of the day, you know, um, a lot of the countries in the West uh, we have a reasonable amount of food and water resilience, but the very poorest communities, they will be facing famine, they will be facing droughts, war, um, mass migration, and it's those people who are going to suffer the most in terms of mortality and morbidity uh, as a result of climate change. Mm. And it's coming home to us all the more, all the time, isn't it, how interconnected the world is. Uh, a war in one part of the world leads to migration that impacts on another part of the world. Absolutely, Absolutely so. All right, well, now let's think about my current job in health technologies in the West Midlands. Um, I wonder, Zappa, to what extent you foresee that technological advances might help us meet some of our health challenges going forward, and maybe they'll present us with some new challenges out of their use. What do you think? Uh, I, I was looking at um, uh, uh, the effect of digital apps for lifestyles um, uh, over the last year or so, and I was actually quite surprised. There were hundreds. Of, I think there were over three hundred thousand apps, uh, um, and I was actually quite surprised how 
uh, how promising they were in terms of lifestyle change. The evidence is certainly growing. It's still poor, but it's certainly got a lot of, uh, a lot of potential. And they're getting a lot more sophisticated now with a strong psychological component, strong personalised component. And I, I think artificial intelligence uh, clearly will have a big impact on healthcare, whether it's uh, diagnostics or whether it's, whether it's treatments. But artificial intelligence could also be beneficial for public health. I've been reading reports about how they can be used for predicting epidemics, uh, dealing with epidemics, and certainly in terms of uh, you know, lower middle income countries where some, some of the workforces are scarce, for example, radiology, they could be really valuable in terms of interpreting um, uh, radiographs, x-rays, etc. Yeah, I certainly think that um, with AI and uh, machine learning, we can speed up, for example, clinical trials to get uh, um, the, the necessary drugs to market faster. Uh, I think we can identify, as you say, risk populations, um, particular individuals with risk within populations and bring the right care at the right time for them. And I think we can hopefully treat more people out of hospitals, which I think is a very important uh, aim for us to reach in the future. Well, I think I've um, really enjoyed this talk with you, Zappa. Uh, you've been very astute in your observations. I think very generous with your time for those who are watching and some tips which I hope people take to heart. And maybe we'll hear in a moment that uh, some people have their own tips or some views about your tips. <laughs> but let's go back to Chris and see if there are any questions for you. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you for the interesting discussion. Um, lots of people on the line are posting lots of positive comments and congratulations uh, and nice things. Not so many questions yet. We've got a couple to go with um, and apologies in advance, Safa, they're, they're not easy ones. So we'll, we'll kick off with the first one. Um, I wonder what Professor Iqbal thinks about the future of public health in England. Local department uh, directors of public health are relatively powerless and PHE, or, or now the UK HSA, are subject to political pressures. How do we address this? Uh, <laughs> I, I think it depends on where you look. I mean, I've come across uh, many local authorities, for example, Sheffield, and uh, looking at sort of Greg Fell, we actually visited Sheffield, didn't we, David, where, yes. you know, uh, this, is, this is exactly what public health should, should be doing. And the director of public health had that influence over, and not, not, not just, you know, within their own department, but all departments within the local authority, and also in, in that area as well, and with that single solitary aim of improving population health outcomes. So it can work. Uh, I think there's uh, enormous variability across the country and uh, we need to ensure that kind of model is operating everywhere across the, across the whole patch. Uh, in terms of uh, the future of Public Health England and the Health Protection Agency, uh, I, I I think whatever, I mean, there's, a, there's an element of back to the future here a little bit. Absolutely. I'm sure I've seen the Health Protection Agency in the past and we've seen um, uh, there used to be, I'm pretty sure, a, uh, a Department of Health Improvement many years ago. Um, I think we can make this system work. I think whatever system we have, we can make it work. And, and we've got the uh, obligation to take all the opportunities that the new system actually brings. So I'm optimistic and positive about it. Mm. I mean, can I just add that um, you and I saw the last Back to the Future reorganisation of public health when the directors of public health came out of the NHS and were placed with local government. And <clears throat> in terms of the strategy of that, I think that was absolutely right. Um, there are more levers to pull from the local government position for population based solutions. Um, but of course, it also coincided with massive cuts to the budgets of local government. Mm. So I don't think the potential has come through quite as much as we would have liked. And now the next challenge in England is integrated care systems. And to what extent the voice of the director of public health is going to be a regional one, I think, as well as the local ones can actually sway the, uh, the, the big spending of the NHS as well as local government. I, I would really, really like to see um, uh, directors of public health at that integrated care systems. Uh, they could, you know, they, they, you know, they could be the existing directors of public health in local authorities, and maybe one of them could lead, provide that leadership in that integrated yeah, care yeah. system. Uh, I think the health service has really missed uh, uh, public health. It spends an awful lot of money, and I, I would say this, but I think public health. 
uh, has got a massive contribution to, to, to make to, uh, to improve outcomes and, uh, and make better use of existing resources within the health service mm. and the social care sector. Yeah, good point. Okay, back to Chris. Thank you. Okay, this one is, we're in party political conference season. If Zafar have the chance to advise a government of any political colour of one key policy or intervention to improve public health, what would it be? <laughs> um, that's a uh, that's a difficult one, uh, um, uh, Chris. I suppose I mean maybe you know um, there was an interesting interview at the weekend uh, uh, with the Prime Minister, and I was always impressed with the New Zealand approach about putting. Um, uh, well-being at the, uh, at the top instead of GDP. Uh, I think there has been an emotional toll in this country with the pandemic and with the widening health inequalities as well. And the, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the report from Public Health England around the drop in life expectancy is pretty shocking and the gross inequalities there. Mm. So I, I would maybe you know, put uh, those kind of two things right at the front. Maybe you know how we how do we address the root causes of health inequalities, the growing health inequalities we have, and also maybe putting our, our emotional well-being perhaps higher than it is at the moment, mm. as a country. Yeah, I, I suppose what you're talking about is uh, leveling up, uh, and you know we've all got to hope that leveling up becomes more than a slogan and actually does address these um, inequalities in society. Um, I don't see how you can avoid starting from a position of poverty really to tackle the social uh, evils of the time but we'll see chris thank you okay <coughs> so what would zafa think if it would should be the immediate priorities for a young person who is curious about a career in public health so this is pre becoming a public health consultant why should people pick out when they're getting their careers advice a career in public health? I, I suppose what always attracted me was an opportunity to uh, make an impact on a, on a big level, on a population level, mm. uh, and, uh, and also prevention. Um, I, I was actually, um, uh, I was at a conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was an international conference, and the president of Pakistan made an incredible uh, and passionate plea for public health and he talked about how um, the health service tends to deal with a lot of the problems and we could actually prevent a large number of them. So it's really about prevention, it's about that population impact and reducing health inequalities you have an opportunity for. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've been very, very fortunate. I've, I've just, uh, as Ifsa said, in, I've really enjoyed my kind of career in public health. And um, I think that ability, it gives you that platform to make that change. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just think that ability to impact at a population-based level is a real challenge for somebody who's courageous. So if you've got that spirit, yeah. I would say you're the kind of person who should think public health. And again, thanks to COVID-19, um, public health has really come to the forefront of the public's appreciation that it's a workforce that can make a difference. So uh, you know, I think there is a recognition of what public health does, which might have been a bit low level before, but is now absolutely front and centre. Uh, yes, I mean, it's a bit like the England football team. I think everyone's an expert on public health now. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> I think all my family members are all, uh, uh, they've all got their policies on public health there. Mm. <laughs> Chris. Okay, thank you. Um, so this question it relates to how, how can public health departments, GPs and others better harness the community, for example volunteers, in efforts to improve health at a community level? And I'd, I'm, I'm thinking already that maybe some of the learning from uh, visits to the University of Alabama, Birmingham might, might be relevant to this particular question. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Chris. I mean, maybe I can, uh, I, th I think there's um, Judy Kurth on the line as well. And uh, she was quite inspirational in Stoke in that she set up a, a fantastic community development program in very small areas. And they had absolutely staggering impact. It, you know, oh, just one person working there with uh, other, other kind of partners is a really good model. And I was so impressed with the uh, with, with the changes they introduced within those local local communities involving people. 
So I think there are many kind of different models of, uh, of kind of uh, community development. And I, I've always believed that primary care should be a key part of that. And primary care should be seen as an asset uh, uh, within local communities. Yes, I think that question feeds into what you said about primary care, doesn't it? About uh, being a centre of activity that's uh, promoting good public health. Uh, and the health and well-being of everybody in a community. So, I mean, I'd personally like to see lots more co-location of services in GP practices and more work between GPs and those voluntary groups and community groups that Chris mentioned in the question. Um, and I think we've seen a little bit of that with the movement for social prescribing, where GPs, instead of turning to a drug as the solution, turn to something, an activity that people might be able to do in their community. Uh, absolutely. I mean, one uh, one practice I worked with in Stoke, um, uh, whenever they came across a really complicated problem, maybe drug addiction or a vulnerable group, a vulnerable person, instead of maybe turning them away or whatever, they used to give them a super long appointment, you know, to, for a proper assessment. And I think the potential of primary care is enormous. That's great. Chris? Okay, thank you. Um, Slight change of direction on this one, um, Mrs. What future do you see for public health of Pakistan? Uh, future of public health Pakistan. Yeah, Pakistan. Mm. Um, I think this is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity for Pakistan. In some respects, there are, a, a, you know, Pakistan as a lower middle income country faces many kind of issues around uh, population growth, around uh, um, uh, communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, uh, around poor outcomes for children. Um, etc. And I think there are enormous opportunities for Pakistan to look at its public health systems uh, and to, uh, in order to develop the right policies which address some of the fundamental public health issues facing. I think it's very, very lucky that it's got fantastic leaders like Dr. Shazad Ali Khan, who's now the VC of uh, the Health Services Academy, and he's shown amazing leadership over the last two, two or three months, and he's moved mountains, and he's got politicians behind him. So I think it a, really is a once-in-a-life opportunity for Pakistan to create a public health system fit for the future and to develop the right policies and implement them. Mm. I think we've struggled with implementation in the past, uh, and I think we need to look at what public health systems we need to implement the policies. Mm. We talked earlier about the, um, the climate change threats ahead. Is um, the rising sea level a threat in Pakistan? Uh, I'm not sure about the rising sea level. That's probably more Bangladesh, but in, certainly in terms of food and water security, it's an enormous problem combined with demographic changes. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of really kind of big issue, really. Mm. And the other thing I think Pakistan does need is, is a primary care system, uh, a wider primary care team. And I, I know uh, there, you know, some of my colleagues like Dr. Jalil Khan are working to establish a national primary care system, which mm. is really fundamental. Otherwise, um, uh, just dependence on the secondary care uh, system is, 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 you know, is not, is not, is not going to work. Uh, but the, the other th really encouraging thing I would say, David, is that uh, there's been an introduction of a kind of um, a universal healthcare uh, ap approach for the poorest populations. And uh, that's, that's really welcoming, considering you know, the health service that we developed after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly hope they have their voice at the climate talks in Glasgow later this year. Chris? Okay, uh, th the last couple of questions are on a related note, so I'll bring them together, uh, and they are relating, they're from the public health consultant uh, trainee point of view. So, one is if you could meet yourself on your first, sorry, on your first date and your very first consultant post, what would you tell yourself? And another question relates to advice specifically for non medical public health consultants. So, any advice for, for those groups? Okay. Um. <laughs> What would I tell myself? I think one of the things I struggled with, David, uh, during my early years was uh, I came across people who think very differently from me, and I didn't, and in some respects, if I had been more familiar with Myers Briggs and how to deal with different thought patterns and different, how different people see different things, I might have engaged differently. So I kind of struggled with that uh, a little bit. So maybe something uh, I think I could have certainly benefited by learning more about Myers-Briggs and my own type and other people's types and how to interact mm -hmm. with them. 
Uh, in terms of advice for uh, non-medical uh, c uh, consultants, I mean, uh, I think it's um, you know, uh, you know, as we, you know, me, me and David work together with multi to promote multidisciplinary public health. We did as the uh, as the chief executive of UKPHR and as, as the registrar. Uh, I think uh, what I would really like to see is um, a much greater diversity in terms of people applying for um, uh, submitting their portfolios. And in terms of their, their, their kind of advice, I think public health is such a broad field. And I think whatever background you come from, whatever interest that you have, there will be a place for you in the, in, the, in the kind of family of public health. So welcome. And I've certainly been encouraging uh, uh, non-medical staff in my trust to consider public health as a future career. Good. It certainly is a key aim of um, the public health register that there should be a greater diversity and a greater mix of the um, disciplines that contribute to the public health effort. So I very much welcome what you've said about attracting a greater diversity. Chris. Okay, thank you. Um, well, there are no more questions on the chat. So if, it, if it's okay with you, we'll, we'll draw things to a close there. Um, I'd just like to, bef before we finish, to say thank you very much uh, to Zafa for sharing his experience uh, and, and those words of advice and for David for facilitating the discussion. So thank you very much to you both. And just to say a um, very big thank you to you, uh, Chris, and, and the Staffordshire University for host hosting this. Uh, I, I wasn't sure about this yesterday, but I think it was okay today. And thank you, David, for making me feel comfortable. And uh, thank you for asking me some really interesting questions. And also, uh, I think after seeing, you know, surprising me with the uh, in, with the uh, with the screenshot of Hifsa there. Also, thanks to Hifsa for supporting me over the last thirty years. Even though I st still this day, I don't think she um, quite understands what I do at work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're very welcome. Thank you.